going from Cheshire Cat to Dude Ranch, did anything strike you as in terms of their musical development, or like was it? Did it sound more like the same band you worked with? Yes and no. Like you could tell it was the same band. You know, you know where I heard that record probably the most was on the radio. Was not listening to sitting down and listening to the record. You know, I don't think I owned a copy of that record. Which songs do you prefer more? The songs on uh, Cheshire Cat or the songs on Dude Ranch? Hmm. I probably like the songs on Cheshire Cat because they're just absolutely moronically, sophomorically funny. <laughs> and like it actually does take kind of guts to write, to be able to write that stuff and pull it off. Like I really do like those Angry Samoans records. And I really do like those Circle Jerks records. They're that humor, that snide punk humor, like that. Johnny Rotten always had that in his and in his voice. Like part of that is the, is the sound of punk rock. It's that sneer. It's that, hey, you know, it's that, eh, yeah. you know. And so capturing that attitude, I think it's really important. And sometimes things that are a little raw and a little edgier, you listen back to them later and you kind of go, you know, there's a naivete in it that is endearing and welcoming, you know? And also, you know what? Like when you create a project, there is a personal attachment to it that you just can't get out. Like you end up having a relationship with those people or those creations because of, because you went through that. And so you're always, your opinion's always going to be colored one way or another by having that experience. So going back to Dude Ranch, you said that you don't think you owned a copy, but that you heard it a lot on the radio. Is this correct? Yeah, it would play on the radio every day, so you'd hear it every day. And it was like definitely clear that it was a um, a huge step up and that they had kind of not only gotten better at their instruments, but they'd also realized that there was still room to hone the sound of the band, like what the what what Blink-182 was. I think overall, you know, it's like when you listen to it, for me, it's kind of split that way. You kind of hear the band that you worked with on that record before, but then you sort of hear something else and you hear what could sort of happen after that as, as well. That was mixed by Don Cameron, who also worked at West Beach. And I think that they mixed that one over at Ocean Way. I think Don Cameron was a really good choice to mix that record. And that it's definitely like a, and you can tell it was mixed on an SSL. It's just brighter and glossier and squashier, you know? And, and, and that really makes a difference. That makes a, a, that makes a huge difference. I think those Dude Ranch mixes sound really good. And I think it was a great growth record for Blink-182. You know, from, from going from, from where they had been to where they were going. Like, yeah, they had to make that record. I actually... I think I dropped by the sessions. I don't think the band was there. I think Don was just there working, getting a mix worked up. I had to drop off some reels or piece of gear to him or something like that. So I knew that it was going on, but like at this point, I was like so deep in other projects. was like, well, great. Have a great day. I'm heading back to do whatever I'm doing up the road, you know? At that point, I was yeah. working seven days a week making records for months at a time. I'd sometimes work, I'd sometimes work two or three months without a day off. You know, it's just, that's it, it, but that's, that's how busy we were then. And that's how much business there was then. And that's how many records we were selling then in the nineties. You know, it was a good, it, it was a decent business to be in before everything was turned to dust. So you mentioned that in the early nineties, that was like a really, as in general, that was a good time to make records. And now obviously the internet's completely flipped the business on its head. Um, how do you deal with that? Like, as, as, like, how do you work day to day now that it's so different? Well, I def I, I'm more diversified now, right? Like everybody's got a laptop, so everybody's a record producer now. And if you're going to sit around and wait for people to send you records to record or mix, it's just not going to happen these days. Like you've got to hustle and get work where you can. The business that I grew up in is not the business that we have now. It's completely, completely different. I've managed to re reinvent myself, so I'm still part of it because I love this business and I have this relationship with music that um, is really, really important to me. Yeah, it's just a different, it's like you said, it's just a different model now. You know, you have to kind of adapt to it. Yeah, I mean, it's a different, if, if, if it's, a, it's a different way of trying to monetize it because yeah. trying to monetize music right now is so hard. The, the, the main way you monetize music right now is not spend any money making it. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's true. I, and and I, I'm telling you this as a label owner, you know, I'm dealing with an artist right now. 
And, and we're like, oh, well, let's launch this single. What should we do? I wish you to do X, Y, Z. And how are we going to do that? We're going to do it in-house. You and I are going to figure it out. And that's cool, right? There's power in that. And uh, there's self-determination in that. And uh, who's going to support you more than yourself? If you can't get down and believe in yourself and believe you can make something happen, why was it, why is anybody else going to get in line and buy into it? Very, like, very true point. Very true point. I mean, people can love you and support you, but you have to eventually support yourself. Like, you got to figure out how to do it. At the end of the day... Yeah. Clock runs out. You, you still got to turn something in. So figure it out. Yeah. The past few years for me is now that really like I've, I've you know, begrudgingly accepted that the Internet's completely changed the business. I'm trying to figure out, OK, how do I succeed now in the Internet era, even though I don't like the Internet that much? You, you kind of have to adapt. Oh, absolutely. Like, listen, uh, I have to uh, get on to um, the, the three major social platforms every morning for my label. See if anybody said anything or played a song or stuff that I've got to retweet, you know? I probably spend 45 minutes to an hour on social media a day just getting today's message out. But it's part of that platform that you've got to uh, respect if you want to be relevant, uh, not only to yourself as your business, but your artists on your, on your label, right? You have a responsibility to them. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like what you see, make sure to subscribe for more. All the videos on this channel are original. I'm the one conducting all the interviews and editing all the videos together. So if you guys like what you see and you want to support, the best way to do so is honestly just to subscribe. Lots more to come.